Well, who knew that Snowmageddon could last so long? When we first told you that this would be historic, some of you didn't believe us, but now we know for sure. Anytime kids get three straight days off of school, you can be sure it's something they'll never forget. History in the making. Now the tail ends of Super Snowstorm Juno sweeping its way out of this region on Wednesday, and now it's up to the workers as the work crews continue their monumental effort to move all this snow from streets and sidewalks and parking lots around the region. Now, if you're an able-bodied soul, you've probably seen your fair share of a shovel this week, at least a snowblower. But now a big part of this problem, where do you put all the snow? It has to go somewhere. There's so much snow, several schools in Worcester still remain shut down some 48, 72 hours after the travel ban was lifted. They just didn't think it was safe to open back up with all this snow. So many mountain-like piles of snow, it's hard for drivers to see around them. It makes driving difficult. So now we've seen several plow, uh, plow trucks hauling this snow away and big, huge trucks. You might have seen them rumbling through the city, carrying snow to their destination. They're carting all that powder away to snow farms. No, kids, that's not where they grow this stuff. That's a lesson for another day, though, I suppose. A, a snow farm, just a term for a big dumping zone, essentially. Big, empty parking lots. In fact, even the Franklin Park Zoo opened up. All these different areas used to store the snow until they could melt it away. It's a lot of work to be done. Meanwhile, down along the Cape and Islands, people living there felt the brunt of this storm. They took it right on the chin. Waves crashing down onto Nantucket, at one point wiping out all the power on the entire island. Now, almost everyone does have their power turned back on. That's a big thanks to utility workers hauling all of their big equipment over to the island on a ferry. This man actually came all the way from Canada. We're waiting to get on the ferry to go on Nantucket Island where I've never been there. We know we're going there to restore the power. You know, it's funny, I'm from Canada and we're supposed to be the, the snow country. And uh, we don't, there's a lot more snow right now here than there is home. Now, just a couple dozen people still in the dark on that island, but with so many homes flooded and now frozen on the inside and out, there's still a lot of work left to be done. On Wednesday, Governor Baker took a chopper flight to Nantucket to see the damage for himself and to connect with several struggling families. Now, he took that flight shortly after stopping along the South Shore with Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. Those towns, of course, hit extremely hard by the blizzard. To start out the day, Baker and Polito both met at, uh, with local officials at Situate Town Hall, the new governor pledging to help the town get more front-end loaders to help clean up so much of this flood debris. Now, remember, this was a hurricane-type storm that moved here through just in the winter instead. Now, Lieutenant Governor Polito toured storm damage in Situate, also next door in Marshfield. She says the state does plan to build a stronger seawall after... Massive winter waves washed the seawall right into someone's living room. Moving this debris and restoring it for the short term, but then long term working on the solutions with a more powerful barrier here to protect not only the structures here, but the people that live here. It's hard to imagine just what those people are going through right now. So much devastation, so much work still ahead. If the heavy coats of frozen ice draping entire homes wasn't the final clue, local officials now making it official. Many of these houses now condemned. Situate was bad, but Marshfield even worse. Timothy Mannix stayed behind with his home when the hur for, uh, hurricane force winds came blowing through, and now he's got the scars to prove it. A massive gust of wind and a wave taller than even his own house shattering his sliding glass door, the glass shattering right on top of his head. He'll recover, but his house is gone for good. The back wall completely caved in, the structure just isn't safe anymore. Fortunately for him, he's just recovering from a few bumps and bruises with some stitches in his head. And while the worst of the dangers are past, there are still several hazards on the roads. And even walking down the sidewalk could be a problem for some people. We're not out of the woods just yet. Of course, with so many people in Boston confined to a wheelchair, Mayor Marty Walsh asked all local residents to do their part at their own home and look out for the disabled and the elderly help shovel a path to their house, make sure there's a path up their stairs so they can get out as well. Now, one last image from the storm before we move on. Check out this lighthouse here, 87 feet in the air. It's pretty high up there. Now ice, nearly 12 inches thick, coating the very top of the lighthouse. What once stood as a beacon of safety from peril at sea, now a haunting reminder of the blizzard of 2015. 
But of course, out in Arizona, it's much warmer there, must be nice. The Patriots getting even closer to that big game. And yes, they had to go through another day at Super Bowl Media Day. Now, even though Coach Bill Belichick has already made it abundantly clear, he's not answering any more questions about Deflategate. The coach did have to answer some more questions about cheating, though, but reporters, I think, are starting to learn he can take the heat. Does it bother you at all <clears throat> that there's a, natch, uh, a national perception that the Patriots are just a bunch of cheaters? Yeah, right now our, um, our focus is totally on the Seattle Seahawks in this game, and that's, that's really what we're, what we're about this week and what we'll be about from here on out is how to prepare our team and compete as well as we can uh, Sunday afternoon against a great football organization. Does it now, just to put things in context here, just th those are some tough questions, but it was just almost three years ago, almost to the day, Aaron Hernandez caught a uh, touchdown pass in the Super Bowl. Now he's facing a much more difficult line of questioning in the murder of Odin Lloyd, opening statements already underway in Fall River in that trial. Now, to be clear, prosecutors do not have to prove that Hernandez was the one that actually pulled the trigger. In fact, they're not even accusing him of that. They just have to prove that he was an accomplice in the whole thing and participated in Lloyd's death. We'll know more as we move on.